Recording in progress. No. Okay. Pam is has a PhD in art history from the University of Delaware and was the head of the Department of Visual Arts at the University of North Georgia right here in Delania. An experienced lecturer, Dr. Sashant has presented at numerous conferences, universities, and museums, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. As an academic writer, Dr. Sashant is featured in the University Press of North Georgia and in art history publications, which include the Archives of American Art Journal. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Pam Sashant. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to go okay. ahead and move to screen sharing. And I also am going to minimize so that you are able to, to see what I would like you to see, that is my, my presentation. Thank you very much for having me this evening. I very much appreciate it. And, I am, and you're, not sharing any, you're not sharing anything. Um, well, she's sharing her image. Right, but you, your, your screen, uh, are you, are, did you put up your, uh, yes, your I did. PowerPoint? It's not being shared. I'm, being, I'm seeing your screen. Oh, but here I'm we not. go. Here we go. Let's see. All, all, all participants. Let's see. Can you see now? No. No. Okay. We can see you. Right, but that's not the point. No. Let's try that again. Try it again. Margo says she can see the slideshow. There we go. That worked. Okay, great, great. Needed to push a different button. Great, wonderful. Well, here we go. Here we go. Um, without technology goofing us up just a little bit, we wouldn't know we were using it. So again, thank you very much for having me this evening. And here we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to date 19th century photographs, and we're going to use a variety of means to do that. We're going to look at clothing, and we're going to look at accessories and hairstyles within the photographs and details in the photographs, such as the backdrop. But we're also going to look at the type of photograph. That is, for example, is it a daguerreotype or is it a cabinet card? Uh, and we're going to look at the type and style of photograph case or mounting card. And I'll talk about these different types, show you examples, give some brief definitions. This isn't a, a talk about photography per se. That is, we're not going to focus on uh, photography, but we'll need to talk enough about photography for, for you to understand these different types, which is important because that pertains to when, uh, what part of the 19th century the photograph might have been made. So let's jump in. Did that advance okay? Everybody? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful, wonderful. So we're gonna start with daguerreotypes uh, because daguerreotypes were the, the first type of photograph generally that, that um, uh, we're going to see. There, there were other types of very, very early photographs, but daguerreotypes are the most common type that you're first going to see. And a daguerreotype is a silver coated copper plate that has been sensitized with iodine then developed with mercury and fixed with hyposulfate of soda or what's commonly known as hypo. And interestingly enough, hypo is what's still used to fix photographs to this day. So that part has remained constant even though we've moved beyond daguerreotypes for, for quite some time. A uh, daguerreotype is a, is a single positive image as opposed to creating a negative. It, it, it is a positive image and it cannot be reproduced. So, so there was only one of each. And a, um, uh, what I'm showing you here is the various components of the daguerreotype in its case. There's the daguerreotype itself, and then which is the copper plate. There's a brass mat, there's a piece of glass, and then there's a brass preserver. All of those things are placed within a case. 
And if you're seeing a, a complete setup, you're going to see all of those things. Um, daguerreotypes were, were invented um, in France um, and uh, came into the, the, the public view in 1839. And they were used pretty much between around 1839 and 1860. They were then supplanted by other types of photography after that. They were introduced to the United States in 1840. So they were here from, from the very beginning. And just to give you an idea of popularity, by 1850, there were about 100 photography studios in New York City. So very, very popular immediately. I wanted to show you because you do sometimes see daguerreotypes outside of their cases. So these are two examples um, of what it might look like. And I wanted to show you because very often you do see damage around the edge of a daguerreotype where that mat, that uh, brass mat had been placed against it. Um, and so if you see an image such as this, um, that it's, it's still a daguerreotype, it's just outside of its case. And then here is another example of a daguerreotype within its case. I wanted to show you this particular one because we know this is a, an early, early example in the United States of a daguerreotype. Southworth and Halls were a, 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 two, a duo of photographers who were very, very popular in Boston in the early years of photography. And this is a, a young woman from the 1850s. One of the ways that we know that it's an early early example is, for example, the mat. Here is a plain mat. They become more decorated, and I'll show you examples of that in a moment. And also the case itself is very simple. Um, the, the cases began um, as, as um, uh, well, they, they were necessary um, to preserve and to protect the daguerreotype, and they began as, as very simple plain or pebble type covers, such as, as we see here. The, the case itself is constructed of wood, very thin pieces of wood that have been covered by leather. And this is the outside of that case. This is a slightly later case. Um, we can tell because it, it has been decorated. It has a, a stamped decoration here. It also has clasps. And you can see the clasps there on the outside. So this is probably a um, case from the, the mid 1850s or a little bit later. Um, the, um, the, the geometric and floral designs began coming in around 1845 and stamping machines were introduced in 1848. So a more deeply pressed pattern such as this one would indicate that this is a case from after. 1848. Um, in the 1850s, uh, motifs did expand. They become even more elaborate. Um, they have gilt trim. Um, and the you see, for example, the velvet pads, um, things of, of, of that sort. So they become more and more ornate, both the exterior, the case itself, and the interior, the, the um, mat and the preserver. They become more ornamented over time. Another thing to know about daguerreotypes is that you must look at them at the right angle. If they, they are not at, at the proper angle to you, um, as the one here on the right is not at the proper angle, it basically looks like a reflective surface. Um, you, you cannot see the image. So that's one way that you can tell that, that you're looking at a daguerreotype as opposed to another type of, of early um, uh, photography. And again, generally it's going to be an image uh, from the 1860s or earlier if, if um, you're looking at a daguerreotype. This is an example of a beautifully ornate um, preserver here, mat and preserver here. An ambrotype is another early example um, of photography. An ambrotype is a negative image on a glass plate that is viewed as positive because of the black backing behind the image. So when, if you take that backing away, or if, if, it, if um, um, the backing has been damaged, then you actually can see through the plate and you will see a, a negative image. 
it um, the, the plate is covered uh, with wet collodion and immersed in silver nitrate, then it is exposed and developed and fixed while it is it is wet. And this is, a, I wanted to show you this particular image because there's the camera itself. There's an example of what one of the cameras would have looked like for both an ambrotype and, and for a uh, daguerreotype. Also, I wanted to show you this image because you can see the head supporter here behind the woman to the right. And that um, is something that, that is commented on uh, often people wondering is that why, why do people so often look solemn in early photographs? Well, it's in part the, the, the holding still, though the, the time that they had to hold still diminished from in very, very early photographs, uh, um, minutes or, or perhaps 30 seconds to, to five seconds or less um, quickly. And by the time we get to um, uh, past um, daguerreotypes and ambrotypes, it's a, it's a matter of a second of needing to hold still. Has more to do with that it was what was the standard to, to, to remain somber, to, to look very serious, to look very uh, formal in one's photograph, had, had more to do with what was considered to be um, the appropriate way to have your photograph taken, um, at least as much as, as the, the equipment that was used. But there, just so you'll know, that's an example of, of one of the head supports. You can see this photograph has the same mat and the same preserver that you would find in a case that was used for a daguerreotype. So the same type of case would be used. Another thing I wanna make sure that we talk about before we get seriously into looking at, at images is another misconception. What color were people wearing in their clothing? We really can't tell looking at the photographs. We can't necessarily tell. What the what color the gowns are, what color the, the 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 suits are that men are wearing. Now, yes, of course, generally men are wearing dark suits, but women are not necessarily wearing black dresses all the time. Um, what I'm showing you here, this is a color wheel, and the colors that we we normally expect to see, the our primary colors, yellow, blue, red, for example. Then this is the wet plate collodion process, which is the process that we're talking about, how these colors look, these same colors look when developed in the wet collodion process. That is, they, they look entirely different and they don't necessarily appear to be dark or pale according to, to what we might think of as dark or pale colors. This is plain black and white photography. And so you can see here, this is, is far more true, though even, even so, um, we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily tell what colors are. But I wanted to point this out because I'm sure that this gown is not a black and white gown that this young woman is wearing. I'm sure it is far more colorful than that. We simply can't tell what the colors are because of the process that was used in developing this photograph. And to give you an example of that, this is a daguerreotype that has a fabric swatch in it. This is the fabric that this woman's dress is made of. Now you would never, ever, ever know that her dress is white, red, and green stripes looking at the daguerreotype. But she actually is wearing a very colorful dress. Um, it's simply that, that we cannot see that um, in, in looking at the image. I wanted to show you this image as well because it does have one of those beautifully stamped ornate covers that indicates that it's a, a little bit later and this one dates to around 1860. So let's, let's go and start with looking, go through time. Now that we've, we've had our sort of uh, little bit of background on things. Let's go through time and let's look at some examples and talk about what the fashions are and what it is that we're seeing here. So in the 1840s, this is the daguerreotype and what you would expect to see in terms of the clothing that people wore, women wore dresses that had low sloping shoulders their bodices were tightly fitted. They had low pointed waists. And you can see that that comes 
down here behind her wrist, bell-shaped skirts, and throughout the decade, those skirts will get larger and larger. Um, and most generally, women in the 1840s wore their hair parted in the center, and they either had um, braids or in some way they had a covering of their hair over their ears generally, um, and then a bun at the back of the head. So she's wearing very, very typical clothing for, for the 1840s. And her husband, who the, and he's actually the photographer as well, uh, William Lanaheim, um, he is wearing a typical outfit for a man of that time frame. Um, men also had very tight fitting um, uh, frock coats. Um, and generally they flared at the waist and their tights were generally um, rather tight. And they uh, did very often have waistcoats or, or vests underneath their, their, um, their coats. Uh, and they had upstanding collars, very high upstanding collars with neckties tied around them. And you can see his necktie tied there. Uh, gen generally in the 1840s, men wore their hair with side parts and um, uh, facial hair was quite popular, though beards were, were not as popular, it just so happens that Mr. Langenheim here does have a beard. Going into the 1850s, uh, fashions began to change some for men. And for men, um, there, there began to be a, a, a greater number of different types of clothes. Um, so for example, men still did generally wear matching waistcoats and trousers. Very often their, their coats matched as well. Um, this is the era in which we really begin to get into the big mutton chops for, for men. Uh, they still wore, men still wore the, the high upstanding collars. You can see that here in the photograph as well with the, um, the tie coming all around. Uh, and um, uh, morning coats were introduced for men in the 1850s. Um, those were, there were um, uh, coats that would be cut away, and this is an example here, to gradually um, extend back. Uh, and um, this is an extreme example of a morning coat here for riding. Um, it was also still popular to have morning coats, um, that is coats that were, were uh, just cut straight down so cut, cut back and coming straight down were the two styles. And uh, a new style was being introduced at the time. What um, will be, is the forerunner of the modern suit coat for men, um, what was known as a sack coat at the time, that is a, a more informal and shorter um, coat were being introduced at that time. Um, and they called those sack coats or lounge suits. Uh, it was still popular for men to wear top hats. That was the most common headdress for the fashionable man at the time. Uh, bowler hats were introduced in the 1850s, but they weren't worn by gentlemen that early. So as you can see, this man has a wonderful, wonderful tall, tall top hat here. <laughs> Women in the 1850s. Um, their skirts were becoming larger and larger. They were becoming uh, more domed and bell-shaped. And at this point, they're, they're supported by, by crinolines. The metal crinoline was introduced in 1856. Mm -hmm. And they'll be their largest between about 1859 and 1864. Um, so these large, bell-shaped dresses that women wore. They very often had deep flounces and or tears, um, such as we can see here. Um, and they did still have sloping shoulders, so they weren't as steeply sloped as they were in the 1840s. And um, a decorative elements such as this is quite common in the 1850s. Sleeves become enlarged in the 1850s and an undersleeve of lace um, or, or ruffles um, were, were very often um, uh, inter, inter, introduced at that point. So high necklines, tight fitting um, bodices and looser sleeves are all characteristics of, of the 1850s. 
This, by the way, is a photograph by Matthew Brady, who you may be more familiar with from his Civil War photographers, but he um, was a, a prominent, prominent um, studio portraitist um, before and after the, the Civil War. This is also from the 1850s, and I wanted to show you again the sloping shoulders not as sloping as the 1840s, but, but still existing, moving to a wider sleeve here, and then the under lace area here. The still have a pointed um, and fitted bodice, um, and the, the photograph, and here it is within its case. This is an ambro type. Um, and um, as you can see here, um, it has been wonderfully ornamented with rouge on the cheeks and gold for her jewelry. This is mm -hmm. not uncommon if one could afford to have it done. Uh, and um, also, by the way, her hair is very typical <laughs> of the 1850s with these side curls and then um, very often uh, lace or, or, or flowers or some sort of ornamentation in the hair. And I wanted to show you, this is the same photograph, I wanted to show you its case, because this is a different type of case that was introduced um, in the mid 1850s. It's called a union case, not having to do with what part of the country. Um, it's, it's what it's referring to is the union of the sawdust and the shellac that it is made out of. Um, it's made of, it's a, it's a molded plastic, a type mm -hmm. of, of plastic uh, made from sawdust and, and shellac and all sorts of, of ornamentation and designs could be made out of the union cases. Uh, and they were very popular. Eighteen sixty or so, you're going to really begin to see tin types coming in. They were introduced in the mid eighteen fifties, um, and they will be used. Um, for at least the next, next decade extensively in photography. You're going to see them um, until the 20th century, however, but in if you do see a tintype in a case, then it probably is from the 1850s, 1860s. After that, they generally won't paste images anymore. And this is a, a lovely example of a highly ornate um, case um, uh, mat and preserver. Um, and this is a, a, a tintype. A, a tintype is, is a negative image on an iron plate that is viewed as positive due to the black varnish that is painted on the back of the tintype. Uh, and it's the same process to create it as an ambrotype, but a tintype, again, is, is printed on, on, a, on an iron plate as opposed to an ambrotype is, is printed on a glass plate. Um, it too, as with a daguerreotype, an ambrotype, a tintype is, a, is an in, individual image. It can't be reproduced. And um, this is dated to around 1860. We can see that this young woman still has um, uh, the, the side curls um, uh, that were popular in the 1850s. Um, she hasn't moved into what will become more typical style hairstyles for the 1860s. Impact of the Civil War uh, photography. Much more difficult to carry a, an ambrotype or a daguerreotype. Um, both due to their fragility um, and due to the, the difficulties in viewing them. Um, uh, and when the tin type was invented, it was a, a type of photograph that would be seen much more commonly um, as, as, for example, a photograph that you could take a picture of your sweetheart and carry it with you in your pocket once you had gone off to war. Um, so this will be the, the first war in which photographs of, of loved ones both remain at home and also go off to war with soldiers. Fashion plates are a great way to double check 
Um, how am I doing and in, in engaging where, uh, what part of the, the 19th century and images from. So for example, you know, they're, they're always dated. You can look at, and this is an example from 1862, and I can see the sorts of things that I would expect to see in, in a uh, in, uh, fashion of the time. Women still wore high tight bodices um, and um, their the white lace was quite popular um, at the neckline or collars at the neckline. Um, lace and, and um, frills here at the, the wrist as well. Um, the sloping shoulders um, will continue, not as extreme in, in their restriction of movement, and then, uh, but, but still continuing from the, the 40s and the 50s. And those wide um, sleeves that we had seen before, again, with the lace underneath them. Um, the um, uh, pagoda sleeves, they, as, as I mentioned, they were known as. And uh, the, the pointed bodice of the earlier decades gives way to a more rounded bodice waistline, uh, very often slightly above the natural waistline by the time we get to the 1860s. Um, skirts continue to be very, very full uh, in the 1860s, and they will still continue to be bell-shaped until around 1865, uh, when they'll start to lose their volume in the, the front, and there'll be a greater emphasis of the dress towards the back. But again, here in the, in the, the early 1860s, um, this is what we would expect to see. Uh, hair is um, beginning to be pulled back more as opposed to the, the, the rings, ringlets of hair that we saw before. And women are still wearing bonnets, uh, but, but that will become a less popular type of, of hair covering um, as we move through the 1860s. What I'm showing you here, and this is the year after the fashion plate that we just looked at, what I'm showing you here is those that high round waistline that we associate with the early 1860s and the, the sloping shoulders, the wide sleeve, the bell-shaped skirt, parted hair in the middle, hair pulled back, just absolutely classic, 1860s. And how absolutely wonderful that this one's dated for. So, so we do know it is from 1863. Um, and this is a new type of, of um, uh, photograph. It is um, called a carte de visite. Um, it's an album print. Um, that is, it's made with, um, uh, um, well, let me go back. It's a positive image that's produced from a glass negative. So this is the first type of photograph in which we can take the photograph and make multiple copies of it. So with the carte de visites and with the later photographs, again, you can make multiple copies of them. And it's printed on paper, not on glass, not on metal. It's printed on paper. It's been coated with egg whites. That's where the album comes, comes in. Um, and, um, the, uh, and so the, we're moving basically into a, a much more flexible, much more portable, much less expensive. Uh, type of, of photograph. And these two are photographs that could be much more easily carried with someone. So for example, going off to war, uh, to be able to take a, a, a photograph of your, your loved one with you um, is, is much um, uh, more, more feasible to do than, than in earlier days. This is a, an early carte de visite. Um, and um, they were introduced um, in uh, 1854 in France. They came to the United States in 1858. So this is a fairly early one. Um, they were introduced right before the, the Civil War here. They're the same size as visiting cards were at the time. Um, they're generally two and a half inches by three and a half inches. So you could tuck one into a pocket, but you, it, it became fashionable when you went to visit a friend um, to instead of leaving a visiting card, you would leave a carte de visite um, with your, your photograph, your likeness on it. 
And you're going to most often see carte de visites between uh, 1859 and 1870 or so. Um, so these smaller ones, again, keep in mind the size, they're about two and a half inches by, by three and a half inches. And in the 1860s, one uh, way you can identify 1860s, in addition to the, the, the clothing and the hairstyle, um, is that generally the, the um, sitters are, are full length, um, whether standing or, or seated. It's a, a full length image, most commonly. And here um, uh, we can see the square corners on this card also indicate that it's a, a fairly early carte de visite. Another way that you can identify um, uh, actual Civil War images that were taken during the Civil War is the tax stamp that you can find um, that was used between August 1st, 1864 and July of 1866. Um, a photographer was required to uh, place this stamp, um, sign it and date it. Uh, and um, so that was basically um, a tax uh, that was levied on, on photography. Wow. Uh, we saw this, this image before, um, and this is uh, uh, an, an image that um, we can date because of its tax stamp, and we could also date because it is um, showing the skirt as it's becoming less full um, as we move into the middle of the 1860s. We still have the high waistline. We still have the, the open sleeve. And these sleeves, by the way, as they become a little more simplified, become known as bishop sleeves, um, and as opposed to pagoda sleeves. Uh, and, um, uh, and her hairstyle as well. All of these indicate um, a, a um, uh, mid 1860s. And here we go, 1865. Um, we can see that the, the dresses are still full, but we're beginning to see a greater emphasis on the back of the dress as the dress goes from being uh, more bell-shaped um, to uh, being as a, a, a more of a funnel shape. Um, and um, uh, by the time we get to the middle of the 1860s, you're not seeing as many flounces um, or tears on ladies' dresses. And um, uh, you're seeing a, a greater simplification of hairstyles generally. Uh, and um, you can see the, these sort of flattened um, uh, types of, um, um, of hats with brims as opposed to bonnets are becoming popular by the time we get to the middle of the 1860s. By the way, chemical dyes have been introduced in, for clothing uh, by this time. And um, so again, this gives lie to the fact that we see all these images in black and white and perhaps think that, that they are wearing somber colors, when in fact the colors that we see in fashion plates such as this are indeed the types of colors that were in uh, women's clothing at the time. I um, wanted to show you this particular one because I wanted to show you a couple photographs of children uh, to give you a sense of what it is that children were wearing in this time frame. Um, and um, the children's clothes are, are basically a, um, a variation of, of adult clothing. Um, they have the, the same sort of sloping shoulders, um, gathered waist, at the natural waistline and full open skirt. And here you can see that. Um, children's clothing giving um, a little more room uh, for them to move about, but still having the same basic shape as, as women's clothing at the time. Now, how do you tell the difference between a boy and a girl? in a photograph from the 19th century. That can be a little bit tricky, uh, but really it's pretty simple. Um, most generally a boy has hair parted on the side, as opposed to girls have their hair parted in the middle. So you can't go by the clothing because all boys and girls wore dresses until sometimes the age of four, age of five or so, but keeping in mind what it would have been like to change diapers at the time. 
um, that it was much easier to change a diaper under a dress than it was inside clothes, um, inside pants, that all boys and girls wore dresses until um, uh, well past the age of being toilet trained. So uh, again, Matthew Brady, this is a boy. And some more examples of children from the 1850s and 1860s. Uh, and as you can see, they're all wearing um, similar types of clothing. Um, this is a boy. Oh, this is a boy. Hair parted on the side. Pantaloons showing. It was not at all uncommon for um, boys to have their pantaloons showing. That was um, a, a fashionable thing to do. Um, and wearing um, the same type of, of outfit that, that a, a woman would have worn at the time. Um, this is a young boy. This is a young girl. And here are three girls. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, here, here's a, a good example of what happens to sleeves later in the, the 1860s, and actually the, the very simplification of the outfit. Um, uh, it's still um, clearly of the 1860s and, and having that funnel-shaped skirt, um, the sloped shoulders, um, the, the rounded neckline, rounded waist, uh, but but it's a bit later in the 1860s. This is something that you'll also begin to see in the 1860s where a photograph has been actually glued um, into a, a decorated um, paper frame. Um, and so I wanted to just show you an example of that. You could also find tin types in paper frames. Um, and in this case, I'm showing you the front and the back so that you can see basically the tin types were, were glued to the back um, of these, of these uh, paper uh, frames that um, have some uh, red ink ornamentation to them. Um, and then paper glued over the back of them to hold the tin types there. So these are tin types in paper carte de visite sleeves, okay? And they're from the eight, late 1860s. We're beginning to see some changes in hairstyle, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. The oval, the oval pictures um, that we're looking at um, became popular after about 1863. Uh, and so um, those are in both the earlier here, the oval here, and the ovals here. Um, you, can, you can generally date those to uh, mid 1860s or later. And here are uh, just a few examples of, of different carte de visites uh, to give you some idea of, of different types of styles. Now I mentioned before that we generally saw in the 1860s, we saw full length uh, portraits. That is the, the figure either standing or seated. The 1870s, we'd see more closer views, uh, generally from the waist up. That's not a hard and fast, but um, generally from the waist up uh, more focus on the on the um, not on the entire figure but on the the, the, the face um, and um, the upper part of the body and um, you can see here that these have different types of, of um, uh, borders and different types of ornamentation could really vary different parts of the country uh, different photographer uh, and the, the type of studio um, uh, how much they consider themselves to be uh, workaday photographers versus art photographers things of that sort wanted to show you these as well because we're moving into the hairstyles of the 1870s. The hairstyles in the 1870s become quite ornate um, and um, the use of, of lots of braids, hair both up and down. You can see a long, long ringlet of hair here. Um, and these are all um, uh, characteristics of hairstyles of the 1870s. So going into the 1870s, we move from the, the funnel shaped skirt to skirts that actually have, are gathered towards the back. You might have an overskirt that has been pulled back, or in this case, um, I'm sorry, a side skirt 
that has been pulled back or here an overskirt that has been pulled back. And here you can see she has both a apron like front skirt and then she has another area that has been pulled to the back. You see flounces beginning to appear again. Okay, still have that waistline at, at just about the natural waist. And here you can see that shoulders are becoming more pronounced and definition of the shoulders at the shoulder line. So the emphasis as we're moving into the 1870s um, goes to the back of the skirt um, with trains, with fabric draped up, uh, with an abundance of flounces and, and ruching and, and various types of ornamentation. Um, and um, as we'll see as, we, as we're moving into the 1870s, the waist will begin to drop. You can also see on the, the, um, the hairstyles uh, becoming more elaborate. And as the hairstyles become more elaborate hair, the hats become smaller and are simply perched on the head. I'm showing you just one example of, of an actual dress, again, to emphasize um, the, the uh, use of, of um, dyes, artificial dyes, chemically um, uh, produced dyes at this point. Um, and so the great variety of colors. Another thing that is um, uh, important to, to note in beginning for both men and women, especially in the 1870s, is um, the rise of, of commercially produced clothing uh, because of the, the rise of the, the sewing machine in both commercial and in domestic use, but um, it's going to impact um, the elaborateness of clothing and the variety of clothing. So quintessential 1870s here. Um, what, what we're seeing um, is the uh, emphasis on the hair, the emphasis on the, the, the skirt. We cannot see the skirts um, pulled back here, but the elaboration on the skirts as opposed to the, the plain skirts that we saw in the, in the, the mid 1860s. Um, and um, and in, in terms of what it is that the men are wearing, uh, their coats are becoming uh, semi-fitted. They're, they're not the, the tight-fitted um, frock coats that we saw earlier. And men are wearing more and more of the sack coats that we saw before. You also do see some turn down. Here's a half turn collar and here's a turn down collar. Hair parted um, in the middle or on the side um, and facial hair is quite common in this time frame for men. Quintessential. Uh, uh, early 1870s um, with the long ringlets of hair and as well as the elaboration of hair on top. Again, this wonderful, this is dated for us, so we know that it is 1873. And those fashions of the um, 18, early 1870s by the middle of the 1870s will become um, the, the full bustle and as well, um, the ornamentation of clothing by the time we get to the, the middle of the 1870s becomes, if you will, um, more, more le less um, lighthearted and, and, and more um, serious applied uh, decoration to clothing. Um, this is uh, what some people refer to as the upholstered fashion of the 1870s with the, the um, regulation of trim uh, that, that women wore on their clothing and the extreme tailoring of, of their clothing. You can also see that bodices are beginning to lengthen and this is an example of, of, um, of that. Um, and um, they, so they're long-waisted extending over the hips and very often, almost always, then there's a row of buttons there. Again, middle 1860s, that row of buttons. Um, and this is an, another example of uh, the middle 1870s. Um, the, the interest in having the abundant, abundant hair um, was so great that this also became a time frame in which um, having false hair pieces uh, was, was commonly seen. And I, I and I think it's unfortunate. I don't know what this woman thought at the time, but you can see she has one, two, yeah. 
three yeah. colors yeah. of hair. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, she definitely has, has, has used um, uh, false hair pieces here. Uh, and um, the uh, photographer also has, and this becomes popular in the middle of the 1870s, a slightly longer so that you can see that wonderful bustle in the back. Mm -hmm. And here's another example of um, being able to see the, the back of the skirt by turning the, the, the sitter to the side slightly. Um, what it is that we're looking at here is a, a cabinet card. Um, a cabinet card, um, they, they were introduced um, as early as 1870, but they are really, really popular in the 1880s um, and uh, go into about 1900. A cabinet card is larger than a carte de visite. Cabinet card is generally four by five and a half inches. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that did allow, um, and then and then the card that it's it's put upon is makes it even a little bit larger. This became a space on the cards where uh, the photographer could do some advertising, if you will, um, mm -hmm. so that the front of the card and the back of the card became spaces that, that for ornamentation um, about the photographer and, and his or her services. And we'll talk um, a little bit more about that as we look at some examples. Um, mm -hmm. What else should I tell you about this? Uh, she, um, the rounded corners that you see here is something that, that uh, is coming in use um, generally around this time frame. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that's about all I have to say about this one. So, but we know that we, again, this is a, another, another one that's very helpful to us that we can, we can actually date it because the card is dated. So, you saw this card a moment ago. This is the lady with the false hair pieces. And this is the card you just saw. You probably had no idea how different in size they were. Um, and that's one of the beauties of, of course, holding the cards in your own hands and being able to look at them. This is a card to visite, okay? These are cabinet cards. And this is an oversized cabinet card. This is a standard cabinet card of four by five and a half inches. And this is an extended cabinet card. Um, and um, as I mentioned, they, they um, were popular uh, mainly in the 1870s to about 1900. Um, they were introduced to the United States in, in 1866. They just took a little bit of time to, to um, really um, uh, catch a hold as, as being uh, popular here. Um, and all three of these have the rounded edges, which become more common by the time we get to around 1880. Now, of course, you might have seen photograph albums. And I just wanted to show you that um, photograph albums um, were, were made to fit um, carte de visites and cabinet cards. In this case, we're looking at a uh, photograph album that, that has uh, uh, three cabinet cards and one carte de visite in, in it. Going into the 1880s, what is it are, that women are wearing then? Mm -hmm. By the way, you'll notice I'm not saying a whole lot about men's clothing. Men's clothing really doesn't change a tremendous amount. And it's much more difficult um, to uh, be able to identify uh, for men's clothing um, other than, for example, in collar styles, in the styles of the, um, uh, of the ties, hair styles, and then in um, details of the cards themselves. But we will look at a few more examples of, of men. But moving into the 1880s, um, the uh, bustle of the, the middle of the 1870s has completely disappeared uh, by the time we get to 1880. And we basically have a, a, a long, um, uh, uh, slender silhouette um, and um, great ornamentation that has carried over from the 1870s. Um, long, long waistline, as you can see here, or what um, is actually known as a, a princess style. And we'll see an example of that in just a moment. 
by 1882, we're moving back into the bustle, the bustle uh, style of the 1880s, uh, which is a, 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 a much tighter um, uh, and more structured style bustle than the, that of the 1870s. So this is a princess seam dress that I mentioned before. Um, and basically it is a, a, an overdress that has a separate underskirt, or this could actually be um, one single dress as opposed to a bodice, a top and a separate skirt. This is a, a long extension. And this is um, generally a style of the early 1880s. And this is a tin type. Going into the, the middle of the 1880s, we see that elongation continuing here, even though she has a bodice and you can see the point of her bodice with this um, draping here, this uh, creates a, an effect of an elongation. Um, here, the very distinct and very tight bodice um, and then the draping that continues here. These are, were fashionable styles at the time. The bodices are very tight fitting. The sleeves are very tight fitting mm -hmm. in the 1880s, um, high necklines. And um, oftentimes you do have some sort of ornamentation at the wrist as, as you see here. So, um, uh, and in both of these, you, these are good examples of uh, seeing what's happening also in the studio in photographs. Since we're moving into the 1880s, you see more and more of the um, uh, ornamentation within the studio itself. Um, that is, you very often have painted backdrops, and but these are both painted backdrops. Um, and you also have objects in the studio. Um, sometimes, of course, individuals did bring objects of their own, but generally these were objects that the uh, photographer kept on hand um, for you to be photographed with. Hairstyles of the, the early 1880s, this is closer to, to what was more commonly seen, that is a, a short fringe of bangs here, um, her hair being completely pulled back, um, uh, and her, her more um, severe style of clothing um, just indicates a, a, a greater simplicity of dress in this young woman. This is a good example of how ornate cards can become. This red band that you see here on this cabinet card um, usually is something that you see in the 1880s. Uh, and um, uh, the, the ornamentation on the back here wanting you to know um, what, what a, uh, a fine photographer he is and, and actually giving you some greater ornamentation on the back of the card um, advertising for the photographer. And this is a wonderfully elaborate studio setting here uh, with, with both painted and, and uh, backdrop and, and actual objects. She has that 1880s, very tightly fitted sleeves, tight bodice, and that, that's, that um, so, um, sway of drapery there in the front. And then the long line of buttons here in the front that, that are, are very common. Then in the middle of the 1880s is the second type of bustle. Different than the bustle of the 1880s, it's the horizontal bustle. Okay, this is the bustle that basically you could put a tray on. Um, and <laughs> it's not the, the, the lovely gathered up soft bustle of the 1870s, it's the more upholstered, um, sturdy bustle of the 18, uh, middle of the 1880s. And um, these, just dresses generally you can see there's it's straight in the front. Um, you, you have a, a vertical line in the front and then the emphasis is entirely on the back of the dress. You have these elongated waistlines as you, on each of these and a different they're all slightly different but they all have elongated waistlines, tight bodices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, white wedding dress. Yes, white was popular for wedding dresses, but don't let that fool you. Wedding dresses could be any color. Mm -hmm. 
By the time we get to the late 1880s, the bustle is softening some and beginning to diminish. You see a little more ornamentation of, of the, uh, and fullness in the front, as opposed to just a, a draping of cloth, a little more fullness towards the front. Um, and uh, we're beginning to see a, a slight peak of the sleeves. Hats um, remain perched on the top of the head. The, the, the um, uh, fringe of bangs here in the front and elaboration of hair at, at the top of the head or along the back, but we don't see the, the side ringlets or, or um, hair down as we saw in the 1870s. Hair is, is decidedly up in the 1880s. And so here is a great example of a bustle from the 1880s um, and the, the uh, tight bodice tight sleeves, um, buttons down the front, um, straight front and emphasis on the back. And a wonderful, wonderful, I love, you love that fire, isn't that great? It's a wonderful painted backdrop. <laughs> Showing you this one, again, you can see that fashionable fringe of hair. And I wanted to show you this one because sometimes it can be so hard for us to also to tell how old someone is. This sitter is 15 years old. And I was quite surprised when I, when I saw um, what her age was the first time I saw this photograph. I also wanted to show you this because in addition to the rounded corners, note the ornamentation on the sides here. That was something that was appearing. Um, in the 1880s, uh, middle 1880s as well. So what's happening with men's clothes in the 1880s? Um, you're seeing uh, far fewer of the, the more formal um, coats, uh, the morning coats and the frock coats. You're seeing far fewer of those and far more of the sack coats or lounge suits as, as they were called. Again, the forerunner of the modern men's suit. High lapels, small lapels, um, very often buttoned at the top, not necessarily all buttoned, but, but generally at least the top button is buttoned. Um, uh, pants are fairly slim. Um, collars are generally upright, though you do as well have the more modern tie and collar uh, arrangement, uh, though you, you did have more cravat type um, uh, tie arrangements as well in the 1880s for men. And as you can see, this man is wearing a bowler hat. They are popular uh, of, among um, various classes at this point. Um, and mustaches were popular in the 1880s. So here you go, guys with mustaches. Uh, and here you can see an example of his lounge suit or sack coat with the top button buttoned. Same here, top button buttoned. In mid 1880s, you can tell by their lovely ladies' bustles and their fringe of hair, their tight sleeves, their tight bodices, okay? and the hat perched on top of the head. Getting towards the end of the century, a uh, bodice is not quite as long, but still very tight. Um, and you can see men are wearing the same sorts of, of uh, uh, outfits that we saw just a moment ago. Um, another thing I wanted to show you this is beginning around 1890, scalloped edges on um, the cards become popular. couple of children from around the same time frame, as opposed to the, um, the bell-shaped skirts that we saw for children in the, in the 1850s and 60s, uh, mirroring what women were wearing. Now children, girls, have longer, um, uh, more angular dresses. And you can see that here. Um, in this case, we're looking at a little girl on the left and two little boys in there who have not yet gone into pants and a, a mother with her two sons. Two sons? <laughs> yeah, two sons. These are two little boys. So. <laughs> and, and I can, I know we've moved into around 1890 looking at her sleeves. Okay, I'll talk about that more in just a moment. So here we go, 1890s. 
1890s, at the very beginning, you have, instead of the, the very tight all the way, you have a, a nice little flourish at the top of the, of the sleeve. Um, we, we do have some display at the back. It's not a bustle by any stretch of the imagination, but there is some emphasis on, on, a, um, uh, on the back that will pretty quickly move to being a, a uh, cylindrical skirt um, and no ornamentation of, of the back. These types of hats are very popular in the 1890s, allowing for some uh, fringe of hair here in the front. And I wanted to show you this because it does show um, a, a dress that's quite typical of the 1890s, but also um, an example of a wedding dress that is not white. Um, and you can see here in a more uh, formal affair. He is wearing his morning coat, uh, but he does have a bowler hat, not a top hat. It was popular in the 1890s um, to have these rustic backdrops. And here, let me, this one has a very lovely um, uh, elaborate backdrop, but these rustic backdrops became popular in the 1890s, um, whether it was a, a, a a more, if you will, standard uh, portrait uh, versus a, a more eclectic type portrait wearing his sporting clothes here, riding his bicycle. Um, this is a, a, a tin type that's been somewhat damaged. Um, but um, uh, so if you see backdrops of, that are, are this elaborate, um, it's probably from the 1890s. Early 1890s, we can see those wonderful flourishes there at the top of the sleeve the very tight bodice and it's in these it's extending down beyond uh, the waist um, and so we have um, high collars tight bodices narrow sleeves uh, and um, uh, lots of buttons still lots of buttons and then the cylindrical skirt some women's fashions became uh, more masculine in appearance, as for example, this does with the rather jacket looking appearance of this bodice. By the way, can you see there's a little shadow here? Mm -hmm. And there, her waist is not quite that slim. <laughs> And here you can see it even more. This is an example of how photographers could go in as very, very popular as those slim waists were, that photographers could go in and they could scratch away at the, um, at the, at the negative and uh, make the appearance of a, of a smaller, more fashionable waistline. But here is a, a, a young woman who is indeed this slim. Uh, <laughs> and we're moving here from the characteristic of the of the flourish of the of the um, sleeves to actual poof of the sleeves. And um, uh, from um, 1893 or so, they're going to become much more exaggerated. But just to show you, moving from 1890 into the early 1890s, a little uh, greater. Um, uh, 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 poofiness of the sleeve. We still have some bang action here. Um, and we have that cylindrical um, uh, skirt that, that we've seen in others. Um, he is wearing a, a, a more formal um, uh, uh, coat here. And sleeves are loosening. As you can see, they're oh. widening. Um, yeah. Here, it's a it's a overall loose sleeve that is um, uh, uh, gathered slightly below the the, um, the the elbow. And in this case, we don't have the elongated um, waist. We have now what is uh, coming into fashion by the middle of the 1890s. We have um, a uh, back at the natural waistline um, as well. There is an emphasis on, on the horizontal here in the bodice area. Uh, so some sort of horizontal ornamentation mm -hmm. becomes popular in the 1890s. And we'll look at that. You can see that even more because we're moving into the middle of the 1890s. We have what are known as the, the Lego mutton sleeves. Um, those huge, huge sleeves that were often actually um, stuffed um, to make them uh, stand out even, even more that then from the um, elbow down 
she does not have she has on a more masculine attire and mm -hmm. a, a more feminine look um, and she has that that belted waist and then the emphasis on the horizontal here at the bodice area you can see that again here Another thing that you can look for in the middle of the 1890s is a top knot. Uh, women uh, very often gathered their hair up into a top knot. He's dressed in, again, formal attire. He is dressed in, and this is a, he's wearing his outer coat as well as you can see he's wearing a coat underneath that. So he's wearing, if you will, the more um, typical men's attire of the 1890s, and he's holding his bowler hat. He has a four in hand knot, but he still has a stand up collar as opposed to a fold over collar. And then here are, are examples of the extreme leg or <laughs> mutton sleeves of the of the middle of the 1890s. <laughs> and some examples here. Um, mm -hmm. The small waist emphasized by the crossing over, um, and just a tremendous embellishment of the of the of the <laughs> sleeves and the scalloped cards, as we saw before, 1890s. Two more examples: oh, middle of the 1890s, very very full sleeves, uh, and the top knot, as well as the crimped hair. <laughs> And then a lovely example from the middle of the 1890s. Scalp card again. Sleeves, if you will, it's almost as if they're collapsing. Um, by the time we get, we move to the late 1890s. Um, uh, and um, basically you can see the difference as, as we um, move back into um, a, a sleeve that, that follows the shape of the arm more naturally. And then right around 1900, um, and um, this is becomes a time frame in which um, graduation photographs become individual graduation photographs become more and more popular, uh, and that's what we're we're seeing here is an example of that. Um, and she's wearing her her lovely graduation ribbon corsage. Mm -hmm. And then to finish out, I brought for fun. These are too late tin types. Uh, this first one um, that is from the, the mid 1890s, you might have been able to guess that from the sleeves here. And she's wearing her outer clothes. She's wearing a, a jacket. Um, she's simply wearing her, her uh, regular clothing. They're both wearing their hats. And I wanted to show you these because when you see a tin type this late in the century, it very often is a tin type for tourists which would partly explain the clothing that they're wearing. That is, they're, they're, they're out um, uh, um, you know, doing their walking and their sightseeing um, and, um, and wearing the clothing that they, they would have been wearing, not, if you will, dressed formally to go to the uh, photographer, but, but as they, they are out and about as tourists. And then the last one that I wanted to show you, just because it's absolutely delightful, <laughs> is uh, another tourist tin type. Um, and this one dates to around 1900. Uh, we know that it is not later than 1907 because the, the backdrop, the painted backdrop, and there you can actually see the edge of the painted backdrop. Um, so this is in a studio. She's not at the seashore. There's no mermaids here. Uh, but that, that building, the Cliff House in San Francisco, burned down in 1907. So we know that this is dated before then. So, so that's what I brought to show you. And now let me. I, I, I don't know actually if I've gone over my time. I probably have, but let me find out if, if you have any questions of me or, or anything you've been waiting to ask. Where is that? Wait, wait. So, talk, talk to me rather than the screen. Oh, okay. We'll talk to you? Yes. Yeah, you can leave the lights off. Let's turn one light on. I've got conflicting signals. Yeah. I've got one that wants the lights off. Well, we can see her better this way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a short question. 
Are those full skirts in the late 1800s, were they what we now call the hoop skirts? The, the hoop skirts that are specifically from the 1860s, 18, late 1850s and 1860s. So that's when women were wearing, were wearing the, the wide, wide hoops. Um, now they did have, they did have a, a different type of hoop under their bustles, but, but the types of hoops I believe you're referring to are late 1850s to 18, middle 1860s. Thank you. What was the purpose of the bustle anyway? <laughs> Fashion. Fashion. If, if, if fashion is the answer, then that's fine. I was just thinking that there might be some sort of. Well, know. well, basically, it started. How it started is all that that volume of fabric from the 1860s, as as they moved from the, their, them being the the huge bell shaped. They basically were taking that fabric and gathering it back, okay. and that became a volume at the back that became the bustle. How did they sit? Um, they did have well, sideways. Yeah, they, <laughs> the, the hoops that they wore underneath those bustles would collapse when you sat down. So, <laughs> so they compressed. Help that stick On the photograph that you showed that had the sample of the woman's fabric from her dress, was that a trend or what was the purpose of that? simply um, included the piece of fabric. They, they included it with it. Every once in a while, you'll find a, a photograph with a piece of fabric attached. I think in part because they realized that you couldn't tell what the fabric was, uh, what the colors were. Um, and so um, some women did actually attach a piece of fabric to their photograph. That's Considering one how elaborate I'm sorry, go ahead. It, that's one of the things about, uh, one of the beauties of taking apart if you have cased images, very, very carefully taking them apart is sometimes you find treasures inside them. Yeah. Considering how elaborate some of these are, do you think it's more representative of the wealthy people? Well, that's why I tried to show a variety of images um, and I, I did not show any high society. I, I did not show any extremely wealthy individuals. Um, um, these are all photographs that are, are from a private collection um, that were purchased at flea markets and antique shops and, and various places. Uh, th these these are, were not the, 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 the people who were going um, to um, really show off their, their, their fashions that those of, of the 1% could wear. Right, but do you think that this was ordinary everyday wear? It was it was your Sunday go to meet and wear. Okay. Yeah. Dressed for the photographer. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, there was was there any type of like certain etiquette that they would have for taking photographs? You mentioned in one of the pictures about the sittings lay that had the support for her neck that there were certain ways that they wanted you to sit and so forth. Was there an actual etiquette that they wanted people to look for whenever they came to to a sitting? I think in, in a way, no more so than not, we, we don't have a certain etiquette for f photographs anymore, um, but, but the way that, that we posed for photographs uh, several decades ago, that you, 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 you had certain ways that you sat and presented yourself, um, mm -hmm. and those, they had the, their own standards of the day. Does that, does that help? Does that answer your question? It does. I was just thinking because now, since it's so more mainstream, people are more familiar with it. But back then, this was a long lasting keepsake. And so they wanted to make that a memorable event. Yes, yes, yes. So you were definitely, you wanted to show yourself to your best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing you did. Wait, wait a minute. Hold on a second. One thing you did bring up um, mm -hmm. briefly was at the point where the sewing machine became available. And um, so early on, they were mostly made by a dressmaker, I'm assuming. And at what point would they have been ready to make 
where? Well, the, the sewing machine, by about 1850, um, the sewing machine was invented, what, the middle of the 1840s? Um, and um, so it was beginning to appear in homes in the 1850s. Up to that point, clothing literally was hand sewn. Um, and depending on, on what your economic means were, you, you hired someone or you made clothes based on um, if you will, fabric from, from older clothing. Uh, even if you could afford to have somebody make your clothes, you might make your own more simplified skirt right. and have someone else make the bodice for you. Could use draperies, leftover yeah. drapery. <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing I was wondering is the price of fabric compared to your income back in that day. Yeah. It must have been very... Inexpensive. inexpensive. Um, I can't well, well, you you fabric was relatively expen expensive, expensive, and yeah. you did use um, fabric over and over again. You mm -hmm. you might remake a dress um, yeah. several times over. Hi. Um, okay. Using old I would fabric. think you have to. Yeah. 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 How, how many outfits did a woman usually have and how were they cleaned? Well, I, it really varies, but you would, would generally have at least two to three everyday dresses. And keeping in mind that it, a dress was a, a bodice and a skirt. They were two separate things. Um, and then you, you would, those you would wear frequently changing your undergarments daily or nearly daily. So it was the clothes, that, the, the fabric that was against your skin that you changed and washed frequently. Um, you did not generally um, uh, wash your outer garments. They were um, uh, damp pressed, um, but they were not washed. Wow. Hey, Pam, there's a couple of questions on the chat. Okay. Uh, uh, Margo asked, uh, were the changes in fashion likely to be seen as much in the South as in the North? In other words, were people in the South as conscious of fashion? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Um, people, I mean, it is, it, it's one of the things that's amazing is that you can look at photographs of, of people who were average citizens and within a few years of when those fashions appeared in, in fashion plates, they were appearing on people's backs all across the country. Um, people followed fashion um, and they, they adapted to it as much as they were able to, regardless of what part of the country they were from. There's uh, another one, Pam, uh, from Lisa. Uh, she asked, is there a resource you could recommend that we can use to compare our, our own photographs to help date them? Um, the, the handout that I um, provided um, that um, I am happy if um, to, to, to any, you know, the handout that, that I gave to, to Chris um, uh, has all sorts of, of um, suggestions on how to do that. So uh, I'd recommend have a look at that. And if you need more resources after that, I would be happy to talk more. Oh, okay, for those people on Zoom, I will make a photograph of that. I'll make a scan of that and I'll add it to the end of, of the video that I'll publish and put on YouTube. Chris said he'll put it on the Facebook page too. Okay. Thank you. Did you send an email out? Pam, Pam has said that it's an attachment to an email to me, that, that, that hand up that I gave it to everyone. I mean, it's not like a, a the URL can't be copied and pasted, right? Because it's written down on a piece of paper. Do you have a, do you have a, something like a Word file that you could send out that you could just click on those URLs? I think the, those are probably book references, aren't they? Um, most of them are, are web references. Um, oh, okay. Between Chris and myself, one one way or another, we can get it to you. I'm thinking that, yeah, like if you, you had it in a Word file when you originally made that yeah. sheet, 
send out the word file and we can we can distribute that so that all you have to do is click on the url rather than type the whole thing else i'm notorious for mistyping things <laughs> I sent it to Chris and I'm happy to send it to whoever would like to have it. Yeah. So one last question, kind of a little bit off the subject, but uh, I found that during the Victorian era, that death photography, taking pictures of your loved one, the last photograph of your loved ones also became popular. Have you ever run across any photographs from the 19th century, which included little crops of hair, which they would include as like a memento for the oh, early part of there? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I didn't include any death photographs um, that not not being part of the talk, um, but um, um, yes, definitely. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. You are more than welcome. It was a pleasure. Taking the time, you know, all the way from Texas to be with us tonight and share that wonderful amount of information. And uh, we will be sending you a gift shortly uh, in appreciation for you, you know, speaking to us tonight. And uh, look forward to hearing from you again somewhere else down the road. Wish you all happy travel down there in Texas where you're at. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure seeing everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.